As you fly over the Caspian Sea, you can almost smell the oil. Every few hundred meters, another giant rig juts out of the water. Whole communities of oil workers and their families live at sea. For oil men like Bill Messerall, this is the new Persian Gulf. There's a lot of it. I mean, uh, by all accounts, you know, we're talking 100 to 200 billion barrels recoverable oil. Uh, that's a lot, and uh, this is a mega. It's a mega area. I mean, it, it's huge. For the past four and a half years, Bill Messerall has divided his time between Texas and Azerbaijan the former Soviet Republic that straddles the Caspian Sea. A few years earlier, it would have been unthinkable for him to come here. Soviet pride and paranoia closed the oil fields to Western technology and expertise. Instead, they stumbled on with Soviet inefficiency to exploit a fraction of the area's oil. Now, Azerbaijan is an independent nation, and the oil fields are open for business. At this rig, Bill Messerall's team is installing a filtration system to stop the pump becoming clogged by sand. It's standard technology on western rigs, but it's such an advance for here, it's expected to double the rig's output. When the Caspian Sea's full potential is tapped, its oil fields are likely to yield more petrodollars in we'll get it after they get this is one of the last great frontiers. You, we will never be repeating what's going on ever again. I'll never be able to repeat it in my in my career. It, it won't happen, or anybody else's, because this is one of the last true frontiers. The center of this frontier is Azerbaijan's capital, Baku. The town hasn't seen this much foreign activity for 80 years. The whole building was constructed by the greediest Azeri oil baron, Musa Nagir. But though he was the stingiest one, he built the biggest number of excellent houses in Baku. And Fwada Hundov is a Baku policeman who makes his best money moonlighting as a tour guide for visiting oil executives. But the boom he's describing began more than a century before he was born. In 1852, Baku became the center for the world's first oil industry making millions for the Nobels, the Rothschilds, and even some fortunate locals. So how rich a town was Baku? It was an immensely rich city, immensely rich city, because it was the time when an oil gusher, and Baku was famous for marvelous oil fountains, could make an owner of a small piece of land a millionaire overnight. And uh, actually, Baku was providing more than half of the world output in oil by 1901. Only a minority became rich from the first boom, and today less than a handful survive. Quad took me to meet Baku's last oil aristocrats. Sarah, Marion, and Adelia Azhebekov are all approaching their centenaries but they've retained the manners and even language of their upper-class education. I understand English, but I speak well French. You speak French? Yes, I do. How do you speak French in Istanbul? Their home is a crumbling Soviet apartment, but 80 years ago they lived in Baku's finest mansion. No, my father was a corrupt and corrupt man. He had a lot of religious words all over the country. Then he had a few houses. We lived in a very beautiful house, you know this house. In 1920, the Bolsheviks shot their father and took everything they'd owned. They fled to Turkey to live in poverty. 
A few years later, they decided it was safe to return home. But they found the communists would never welcome back the children of an oil baron. The communist authorities turned a thriving private oil boom into a Soviet monolith. It couldn't be an oil boom in the Soviet days because we never owned any revenues from oil. The revenues were alienated by the state. We were paid very low sum, which sometimes didn't even cover the expenses. The oil was crucial to propping up the Soviet Union, but it brought little benefit to Baku citizens, except perhaps the corrupt officials of the local party machine. But now there are new oil barons and new hopes of oil fortunes. So far, five consortiums of foreign oil companies have signed contracts totaling $22 billion in direct investment. The largest, AIOC, has already paid more than $1.5 billion, and the first oil is only just beginning to flow. Terry Adams, an Englishman who heads the consortium, is confident the boom could eventually mean better times for all. What we're looking at is, as I said, two North Seas to support a, a very well-educated population, but a population equivalent to the size of London. So the opportunity for prosperity is extremely high as long as political stability comes into the region. The man they're looking to for stability is the president, Haydar Aliyev. In true Soviet style, all other traffic has to stop whenever he travels. And no one is more of an old Soviet than Aliyev. In the 1980s, he was Azerbaijan's Communist Party boss, a KGB general and an ultra-conservative Politburo member until he was sacked by Gorbachev. Now he's back in charge as a born-again pro-Western Azeri nationalist and a man the oil companies can do business with. I like this photograph because he's a very, very open, he's a person with a big sense of humour. Mafa Gulazari is his spokesman and foreign policy advisor. That, that's your favorite photo of the president? Yes, it's my favorite photo of the president, Ali. I think that it is his real nature. He assured me that world leaders were just as enamored of the former communist strongman. President Ali is a very progressive person. He has very huge respect. He is in very close touch with all the world, with all politicians of the world has huge respect from President Clinton, from President Cole, from President Chirac. They are working with him. And they are fully convinced that he is a person with a very democratic mentality. The Caspian Sea's oil reserves may have something to do with that respect. Last century, Russia and Britain fought the so-called Great Game. A mixture of war, diplomacy and subterfuge aimed at controlling Central Asia's trade routes. Today, the trade routes for oil are just as tempting and far easier to control. They're simply pipelines. 